Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. We're in the lab of Dr. Frank Gunther at Boston University, and he's going to explain neural prosthesis for us. He'll give us some background to begin with uh, uh, about the brain and about language processing. Uh, Dr. Gunther, welcome. And Thanks for having me. I'd like to ask you why is the brain so complicated in terms of uh, language? Why is this such a complicated phenomenon? Well, language is uh, unique to humans, uh, of course, and it uh, involves a very large number of parts of the brain, including uh, prefrontal cortex areas that are involved in cognition, so formulating what you want to say and uh, creating the words that you uh, want to uh, project out to the uh, listener. Then this information has to be transferred into movements of the speech articulators, so the lips and the tongue and the jaw. And the speech articulation system is one of the most complex uh, motor systems uh, out there. It's the most complex act that humans perform. It involves uh, over 100 muscles in the respiratory system and the vocal tract and the tongue. And somehow these words have to be translated into appropriate movements of these articulators. And the end goal of this has to be a sound signal that's sent to the user. So. Uh, sensory uh, information is very important as well, so auditory information mm -hmm. in particular that tells you that the sounds that you intend are coming out properly. Uh, because it involves all this uh, high-level cognitive information, motor information, and sensory information, it's one of the highest level, uh, most complicated tasks that the brain performs, and possibly the most compli okay. complicated. Okay, well, what can go wrong? <laughs> Well, a lot of things can go wrong in this uh, system, and uh, in particular, uh, we look at cases where the brain has been damaged through stroke, and there are several levels in the system that are commonly encountered uh, as a result of stroke. The highest level sort of stroke would be in the uh, left inferior frontal gyrus, so that's part of the prefrontal cortex, that's a highly uh, cognitive sort of area. That's uh, uh, damage to that area results in what's known as Broca's aphasia. Mm -hmm. And Broca's aphasia is an inability to formulate uh, sentences and produce uh, language output. Uh, Broca's aphasics have very limited uh, verbal output. Sometimes they can only say one word, for example. Uh, lower level damage, slightly lower in the hierarchy, would, which would be in the premotor cortex, uh, results in what we would call apraxia of speech. And in apraxia of speech, the brain is able to formulate sentences, but it's unable to get the motor programs it needs to move the tongue mm -hmm. and the speech articulators to produce the sound. So this is more of a motor programming problem. Uh, people uh, who have a proxy of speech can formulate sentences, but it's very frustrating. They're unable to get the right syllables to come out when they try to speak. Uh, even lower on the uh, hierarchy would be damage to the motor cortex. Uh, this would involve something like a stroke uh, uh, in a lower level of the brain below the cortex that would uh, eliminate voluntary motor output, for example. Mm -hmm or through a disease like uh, amyotrophic lateral mm. sclerosis, or ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, which involves degeneration of the neurons from the motor cortex projecting out to the muscles. Uh, and over time, uh, people with uh, this sort of disorder will lose the ability to move, including the ability to uh, move their speech articulators in many cases. In terms of your work here, mm -hmm. and you're at the very frontier of this, in terms of modeling these, this, um, what does your lab do, and okay. what maybe does the field do? In uh, okay, well that's, uh, that's a 20-year story, yes, uh, effectively. I <laughs> so, uh, we uh, started out uh, formulating a model of the brain that uh, basically uh, had elements that corresponded to the different regions of the brain that are involved in speech, and the model is a neural network model, which means hmm. We're basically uh, uh, producing in the computer uh, modeled neurons and synaptic connections between the neurons. And by changing these synaptic connections, the model learns. So 
Uh, in our case, the model needs to learn to use the vocal tract to produce speech sounds that we present it from our language. And so it goes through a babbling cycle and uh, produces random sounds. Uh, it uses the information from the motor commands it was generating uh, combined with the sound that came out to learn the relationships between sensory and motor information. And this learning process basically tunes up the uh, motor controller, the, the, the parts of the model that produce the actual movements of the tongue and the speech articulators to produce sound. Now we started uh, modeling, uh, I started modeling uh, back in uh, around 1990 and mm -hmm. I uh, produced an initial version of this model that was based on existing uh, literature. So people had run experiments on speech for many years uh, and so I used uh, insights from the existing literature to formulate an initial model that tried to capture uh, the behaviors uh, that are reported in these studies. And about that same time, uh, brain imaging technology came along, which mm -hmm. allowed mm -hmm. us to look at uh, the human brain while it's active uh, during a, a, a task such as speech. And this was revolutionary for our field mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. now we could actually see the working brain uh, during speech, something that had never mm -hmm. been uh, mm -hmm. looked at before. And so we started combining experiments uh, using this technology mm -hmm. with the modeling work to refine our model. So, for example, uh, we have we can make predictions from the model about what should happen if I uh, perturb the auditory feedback mm -hmm. you hear of your speech while you're speaking so that it sounds slightly different than you expect. So, for example, we, uh, we created a device where uh, we could, in real time, change the perception of a word like bet to sound more like bit or bat mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. uh, occasional production trials. And our model makes a very specific prediction about what brain areas should light up when we make this uh, shift. And if our model's correct, then we have verification of it. If it's incorrect, we have information mm -hmm. that we use to refine the model and make a better model. Now, uh, we've done that process for 20 years now in the lab, uh, so we have a, a highly refined model, which is now the leading model in the <laughs> field, that explains the neural mechanisms underlying normal speech. And what we've been doing in recent years is uh, using that model to start look at, uh, starting to look at uh, disorders of speech that occur <laughs> because of some sort of problem in the nervous system. Uh, and there are a wide range of disorders that we, uh, we've looked at. I've mentioned a few already. <laughs> Uh, a very common disorder that we're uh, spending a lot of time looking at uh, now is stuttering, which affects about 1% of the population. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing in our uh, stuttering research, uh, uh, stuttering is very interesting because it's been known uh, throughout history and it occurs in uh, every culture, um, and yet we still don't understand mm -hmm. what causes mm -hmm. it and how to stop it. And so. Uh, what we're doing now is formulating a model of the brain areas that are involved in the initiation of the output of speech. Uh, these involve the uh, basal ganglia in, uh, in particular, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, interacting with the cerebral cortex uh, to generate speech output. It appears from a number of uh, studies that there's something uh, wrong with this circuit, but what exactly is wrong with it is unclear. And what's powerful about our approach is that we build a computational model that actually has to generate the speech output uh, using this circuit. And then we can damage this model in various ways and see what happens in the model. So, for example, we can make a stuttering version of the model that has impaired axons in one mm -hmm. portion mm -hmm. of the brain. That's something that's been seen in some studies of uh, speech, uh, the, looking at the white matter in the brain and people who stutter. Well, we can implement that in the model and we can see what happens both behaviorally in terms of its speech output. So how does it stutter? Does it do movements that are similar to uh, an actual person who stutters? And we can also look at its brain activity uh, and that's yeah. what's unique about our model. It has both a behavioral yeah. output and a neural output which we can very directly compare to the results of our neuroimaging experiment. Our model's uh, components, the neurons in the model, are actually localized in a brain space uh, that's the same brain space that we use to uh, study uh, brain imaging uh, experiment mm -hmm. results. Mm -hmm. So we uh, look mm -hmm. at uh, fMRI, functional yes. magnetic yeah. re resonance imaging, where we can look at uh, blood flow in the brain, which goes to active areas in the brain. Well, the results of those uh, experiments are uh, described in the same space as the simulation results of our model. So we can do a very direct comparison. Is our model predicting activity 
in the proper mm -hmm. areas mm -hmm. of the brain. Um, then once you do this, then you're trying to do an application of this. Right, right. And what's involved with that? Can you describe okay. it? So we've done, so we we use the model in several different ways to look at this order. So one of them is one way is the way I was uh, just describing, which is to characterize the disorder and just better understand it for now, so that later we can think about ways to try to fix it, perhaps with drugs, perhaps with technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, a, a very concrete example uh, that we've been working on involves people who have damage to the motor output pathways. <laughs> that's severe enough to leave them completely paralyzed or what we refer to as a, a, a locked-in syndrome. Mm -hmm. These, uh, the people are conscious, they can hear, they can see, but they can't speak or move. And uh, what we're trying to do in these cases is provide them with a communication channel to speak uh, either, th well, through a computer in this case, through a, a synthesizer that we have on a computer. And we're approaching this in a couple of different ways. One way is to try to decode the actual neural activities in their motor cortex. And this involves collaboration with uh, researchers mm -hmm. who have actually developed hardware that they can implant in the brains of people who have locked-in syndrome. And we worked with uh, Dr. Philip Kennedy in mm -hmm. particular in Georgia who developed a, an electrode that could be permanently implanted and was implanted into the speech motor area of the brain of somebody who, who was locked in due to a, a, a stroke that occurred after a car accident. Mm -hmm. uh, this patient's uh, brain signals were very, very complex to decode, and uh, we started collaborating with Dr. Kennedy because we had a, our model which uh, made predictions, very specific predictions, about what the neurons were actually encoding in that part of the brain. What was the information that we should be trying to pull out of that part of the brain, and how could we interpret that information okay. in terms of speech? And so what uh, we did in that project was we developed a brain-computer interface that decoded the speech signals from the motor cortex while the patient was trying to speak. So these are signals in the areas of the brain that are uh, controlling the uh, speech articulators, in particular mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. tongue. And we were pulling off what we thought were the sounds. Uh, we tried to decode the sounds by having the person first imitate a set of sounds that we uh, scripted mm -hmm, for them. Mm -hmm. uh, we collected brain signals during this imitation process and we built a decoder that would go from those brain signals and, and map them into a predicted sound signal that we could play over the computer speaker to the person uh, who was locked in. And after this uh, process of collecting about a minute of data of them uh, attempting to imitate what was basically a vowel sequence, we uh, then allowed them to uh, control the synthesizer and to try to produce uh, vowels yeah. that we uh, presented to them. So the speaker was able to learn to uh, produce vowels with this synthesizer. Now the synthesizer we were using at the time was very limited, mm -hmm. uh, was capable only of producing vowel sound. That was partly due to the technology limitations at the time. Uh, this implant occurred uh, about nine years ago now, the actual implantation. And so at the time, the electrodes that we were working with had very low uh, mm -hmm. channel capacity. There were only really two wires coming from the brain that we were decoding neural signals from. And so we had to have a very simple synthesizer for the, the patient to use since we had so little information from the brain. With today's more uh, modern implants, yeah. we could have a much higher uh, throughput system. So a 100 channel system is uh, more standard now. And uh, we're hopeful of being able to uh, have a, a patient implanted with a 100 channel system to control a synthesizer that would produce both vowels and consonants uh, in the uh, next uh, few years. But as you know, this uh, sort of research is very time intensive. And uh, for example, a, a, a lot of money and time have to go into getting FDA approval for us to even That's use right, an existing electrode. Yeah. Uh, in our own uh, surgeries. Uh, so uh, we're uh, working through these processes now, but in the meantime, we're working both uh, with new soft, or with several things. One uh, is uh, improved synthesizers. So we have synthesizers now that can do vowels and consonants, right. which are uh, controllable with this sort of inf interface. We're testing new hardware with more channel capacity in monkeys before we uh, uh, start uh, working toward human uh, approval for this sort of study. And so we're testing uh, new electronics and hardware uh, with, in collaboration with a researcher at MIT, uh, Earl Miller, who has a monkey lab where we uh, are uh, testing these things. And finally, we are also working on brain-computer interfaces that don't rely on uh, intracranial uh, implants, so yes. that don't require surgery for an implantation. 
And these uh, are uh, designed in a somewhat different way that John Brumberg will describe later, yes. but uh, these involve decoding intention of a speaker, not necessarily in their intention to speak, but their intentions uh, more generally in a way that can be used to control a communication uh, interface on a computer that doesn't let them speak directly in real time necessarily uh, uh, straight through the uh, interface, but allows them to choose pre-canned uh, uh, phrases, important phrases, right. and so forth that they right. can that you uh, could that add up and accumulate, yeah. Right. right. So, so we're talking in, in several different ways with uh, with different technologies and through several different collaborations, uh, both with uh, developers of hardware, with uh, uh, electrophysiologists doing monkey experiments in this case, and uh, with uh, with uh, medical professionals who help mm -hmm. us uh, find these locked-in patients to uh, work with in our experiments. Are people in the future who are interested in doing this kind of research and does the field itself? depend on these multiple skills. Sure, so the heart of what we do is uh, what would be called computational mm -hmm, neuroscience mm -hmm. and uh, computational neuroscience is the use of uh, computational techniques that have been developed uh, in mathematics and engineering mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and computer science and uh, using those to study the brain and there are many different ways to do this and we've talked about two different ways that we do it in our lab. One way is to actually model the brain with neural networks uh, that are, uh, again, are computational constructs that allow us to model functioning uh, in the brain. But another completely different way that we use computational techniques to uh, investigate and address brain function is by decoding brain signals mm -hmm. uh, using uh, engineering techniques and a number of different techniques that have been developed and developing our own uh, new techniques, mathematical techniques that are fine-tuned for the particular problems that we look at which have to do with uh, translating either EEG signals mm -hmm. collected from the scalp, which uh, represent one form of electrical activity from the brain, or intracranial signals, which involve spiking neurons, and it's a very different form of electrical in activity in the brain. We ne need techniques for translating both of these types of information into some sort of mm -hmm. output mm -hmm. prediction mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what the intention of the user of the interface is. Right, and that's a lot of work. Right. That's going to so, take some time. And it but involved, it looks yeah. like it's really come a long way. Well, it has, and, and that's a combination of, uh, of, of people on the research team that have different backgrounds, yeah. uh, but it's also important for at least uh, some central people on the team to understand many different aspects exactly. of the pro exactly. project. And so, uh, f speaking for my role, uh, uh, I understand uh, much of the computational aspects of the pro project, but I also am an expert in uh, cognitive neuroscience, right. so I've studied how the brain controls speech and language, right. uh, and so uh, having the insight into the brain function has been uh, very useful for development of our particular types of interfaces which are trying to decode speech from the brain, and so the combination of the neuroscience training and the uh, kind of engineering and mathematical yes. training in right. my background has been uh, very important for getting to this point. Exactly. Now different people on the team have different combinations of skills. Exactly. Uh, one of the, I guess one of the last things that I would like to say is just a piece of advice to students who are interested in this is that one thing that many students don't understand until it's uh, late in the process is how important just the ability to uh, program a computer is. So oh. computer programming, even though uh, neuroscience doesn't seem on the right. surface to be something right. that's heavily right. involved in computer programming. Computer programming is uh, com completely uh, uh, widespread in our project at many levels. Uh, under so writing uh, programs to do the experiments, to analyze experimental data, to implement brain-computer interfaces, right. uh, every step of the way requires uh, programming. And so uh, one of my own uh, missions is to try to get more, uh, more uh, computer programming courses in right. undergraduate curriculum uh, right. to prepare people for grad school where uh, they're uh, in almost any science field uh, going to be required to do substantial amounts of Right. Our lab is very crucial for people to be able to at least understand what everybody is talking about. So uh, people in our lab may focus in one of one of the areas, but generally they uh, are familiar with several areas, and and usually they focus in actually uh, a couple of different areas. So right. understanding the brain and and using mathematical techniques yes. to characterize brain function, right. for example, or understanding speech disorders and understanding how. Uh, these uh, models can help us uh, study this disorder. So we have 
speech pathologists in the lab, mm -hmm. we have computational neuroscientists in the lab, and we have people who are essentially engineers in the lab uh, as well. Right. A lot of our uh, work, most of the work that we'll uh, talk about today was funded by a large center grant from NSF okay. called Celeste, uh, which is a center of excellence uh, for education and learning uh, 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 in science and technology, and this grant uh, is uh, involving many researchers, not just at Boston University mm -hmm, in several mm -hmm. departments, but researchers at other universities, including two of the collaborators I've mentioned, uh, Earl Miller at MIT, who's uh, been uh, uh, a great collaborator for us to get to test out some of the technologies uh, with his uh, electrophysiology lab, and Philip Kennedy uh, uh, in Georgia, Celeste, uh, helped us uh, go down and work with him and work with the patient uh, that we were there uh, uh, using uh, the interface with. So uh, Celeste uh, is the, t the, the sort of thing that actually is ideal for this sort of project because right. this project requires several investigators uh, yeah. working together in different labs to really uh, address the problems that we're addressing. And through this sort of large center grant that uh, uh, f more or less forces collaboration across uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. normal boundaries, uh, we are uh, able to make great progress in this area. And the educational component of this is very uh, Im important as well. And Celeste has focused uh, not just on understanding how the brain uh, learns, but also uh, on actually pr providing neuroscience education and education that's interdisciplinary and will allows people to start addressing the sorts of problems yes. that we address. This is Dr. John Rumberg, who is the uh, co-director of this lab, and he's going to explain to us uh, the kind of the part of the work that he does and the kind of preparation that people need. Welcome, Dr. Rumberg. Thank you. Okay. And I'd like to start by asking what is the project that you're working on here. We heard a little bit of the two projects, mm -hmm. and yours is this brain-computer interface specifically, if you'd explain it. Sure. Uh, so I started working on the uh, intracortical implanted project. Uh, I was a graduate student at Boston University at the time, and it was a great combination of the computational neuroscience mm -hmm. skills I was learning, plus my background in computer science and programming and uh, human experiments in, in psychology. Uh, so this was a natural way for me to move forward. We completed mm -hmm. that project and it left the open question, uh, how do we sort of promote this technology? How do we get this out into even more users who could uh, potentially be benefited by a device like this? Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer is looking for something that's non-invasive, something that exists out mm -hmm. there that's mm -hmm. relatively cheap and uh, moderately easy to commercialize and, and, or at least um, uh, mass produce in some way. And so EEG, uh, electroencephalography, is, is one potential way of doing this and it's uh, one of the reasons is that we know so much about it. Mm -hmm. It's been around uh, for a very long time um, and there are so many signals that are available to us. So mm -hmm. that was the direction that I started to take uh, with my own research and then the, the research that's going on in the lab right now. Um, we have a couple of avenues of uh, EEG research. Uh, one is for controlling uh, the same type of vowel speech synthesizer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the interesting thing is, is that in, in the previous conversations we've, we've been having, um, the intracortical implant only had two wires. Yes. And we said that yeah. that was sort of a low channel count. Well, the interesting thing about EEG is that even though we have many, many, many sensors. Mm -hmm, in, in, mm -hmm. in our case, we use a cap that has over 48 sensors. Um, the information that you get from EEG is so different from the mm -hmm. stuff that you get mm -hmm. inside of the brain that we still can probably only control two, maybe three types mm -hmm. of movements at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we're still left with this low channel count, this low information count. So um, we're focusing on that side of the project on uh, vowel synthesis and vowel prediction again. Um, and that's for real-time uh, continuous output. So that's one aspect of the project they're working on. And the signal that that uses, they're called uh, sensory motor rhythms. They're related to uh, motor activations in the, in the brain, uh, very similar to the uh, intracortical implants that we had been working with before. Um, they can be kind of difficult to train um, subjects or, or users who are attempting to modulate their mm -hmm. sensory motor rhythms 
need to be taught how to do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we do this naturally. So when we mm -hmm. move our arms around mm -hmm. and we move our, our articulators around when we walk, these sorts of things, changes the way that our brain responds, mm -hmm. in particular changes these sensory mm -hmm. motor rhythms. Mm -hmm. um, we can achieve the same type of modulation through imagining movements. Mm -hmm. So if I were to imagine moving my hand rather than actually moving my hand, there would be a sensory mm -hmm. motor rhythm modulation. So uh, what we primarily work with right now are healthy users, uh, healthy subjects, who we have to ask to imagine doing those things. Um, and right now an open question is whether or not people who are paralyzed, our target mm -hmm, population, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, is the healthy subject motor imagery equivalent to a paralyzed person actually trying right. to move? And so um, it's, it's, like I said, it's an open question and the training co component is definitely there for, human, uh, for healthy subjects. Uh, the training might not necessarily be quite so severe for a paralyzed subject because they are actually trying to move. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it could be even harder because they haven't, uh, but they may potentially not have been moving for, for so long. So this is sort of a, a much more um, leading edge, experimental yeah. type of interface uh, that is well complemented to the more robust, uh, uh, more immediately available interfaces that we're working on. Uh, and we're using a rhythm called the, or a potential called the steady state visual evoked potential. Now this is a visual cortex, an area of the brain that responds to uh, light coming in from your mm -hmm. eyes, visual uh, stimuli. And it's one of these uh, potentials that we can't do anything about. And it exists in just about every single person that uh, we, we uh, run through the pr uh, protocol, through the paradigm. Um, and what it involves is uh, presenting a visual stimulus, a flash. Mm -hmm. And we use checkerboards on the screen. So you can imagine a checkerboard mm -hmm. flashing really mm -hmm. fast. And that flashing creates a, a stereotypical response in the visual mm -hmm. areas of your brain. Mm -hmm. And what we're able to do is decode those rhythms, determine what that stereotypical uh, response is, associate it with the stimulus that was being shown on the screen, and therefore we have an ability to uh, decide, uh, make a decision on what the user was intending to do uh, related to the choices that were being made on the screen. So this is the type of thing that we'll, we're going to show a little bit later. Yes. Um, and this is, like I said, this is one of these responses that we as humans, there's nothing that we can really do about it. It happens exactly. and we yeah. can observe it, which makes it an ideal uh, rhythm or potential to use for a brain machine interface. Where do you see this all going, say in 10 years, what are the prospects for uh, helping people with this, uh, the brain computer interface? Uh, do you see a lot of rapid progress now or you think it's just going to be nail biting? <laughs> or, uh, um, there's, uh, that's a really good question because right now we've been focusing on locked in syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been our main focus mm -hmm. and it's a lot of the main focus of the field, that mm -hmm. and uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's mm -hmm. disease. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been a lot of progress on decoding methods, finding out what uh, brain signals are best to use and, and what, si uh, what stimuli are best to use. I've just described two of them, mm -hmm. uh, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the SSVEP and the sensory motor rhythms. Um, and that is, a lot of that is ongoing and it's very important. But the, the next part of actually translating our research that we do in the lab into the field, yeah. how do we do that? That's where a lot of the, the movement in the field is right now, getting into rehabilitation. Yeah. Um, and that's where I think a lot of the progress is going to be. And we're going to start broadening out beyond the traditional uh, uh, locked-in syndrome, brainstem stroke, right. ALS populations and look into, well, who else uh, could potentially benefit from a device like this? Um, there's a number of researchers in the field that uh, look to uh, kids and adults right. with cerebral palsy. Yeah. That's um, a good one. They have movement. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not the same as mm -hmm. ALS or locked-in mm -hmm. syndrome, where movement is is cut off. But the movements can be so disordered and so um, uh, uh, inaccurate mm -hmm. that they might as it's almost functionally locked in. They're mm -hmm. not able to do the types of things that they want to be able to do. And so that population introduces its whole new set of prob uh, issues to to overcome with uh, brain computer interfaces. But I think that could be a really large avenue uh, of, of a direction that the field will take. In addition to um, some of the more higher level strokes, 
more, I don't want to call them more standard strokes, but not locked-in syndrome brainstem strokes. Um, there's a couple of researchers in the field that are looking into that population for sort of immediate care mm -hmm. uh, post-stroke. Mm -hmm. And that could be another uh, huge avenue for getting communication right away when you're in the hospital, uh, even. And so that would be a great, I great thing for, for providing the patient with an ability to communicate exactly. with doctors and, and exactly. family members immediately post-stroke. Right, right. So you think that down the line, another decade or so, that it's a very hopeful uh, prospect for people with various levels of disability. Absolutely. The, this, the core of this technology and the core of the research that we do is empowering and enabling mm -hmm. uh, people with speech and motor dis, uh, disabilities. Uh, it, it reintegrates, it, it allows these people to become part of the community, whether it's for long-term care, if you have cerebral palsy, locked-in syndrome, uh, uh, you want to be able to participate in your society. Exactly. As well yeah. as acutely. In, mm -hmm. in a hospital setting, potentially. That, yeah. uh, both of those types of communication, both those types of interaction are uh, incredibly important. And this technology has the prospect of actually facilitating that communication. You had multiple disciplines as well. Did you expect that when you trekked <laughs> off to college? Did you? <laughs> <laughs> so I actually had a, a pretty interesting background. I, I said I was a computer scientist. Yeah. Uh, like many undergraduates, I changed my degree mm -hmm. uh, a number of times. Uh, and I started out as an engineer, mm -hmm. uh, where I learned all about circuits and, 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 and building circuits and building right. uh, engineering devices. Right. And then I switched to computer science, where programming was a very natural fit. And I was also a philosophy major, so yes. I, I, <laughs> and uh, a lot of people ask me, how does that fit together? Yes, well, it does. Uh, <laughs> when, you, when you get to this point, uh, mm -hmm. where studying computational neuroscience yeah. with an engineering bent, with this idea of speech rehabilitation, getting out into a, a, almost a clinical application, right. um, all of those perspectives right. play an, an, an enormous part in, in the whole project. And it's, right. uh, people always talk about, uh, uh, having something that is greater than the sum of its parts. Yes. And really that's what this type of interdisciplinary education does for you. It makes you not just a computer scientist, it makes you not just a neuroscientist, mm -hmm. it makes you something even greater than both of those combined. Uh, and that's actually what we need. Uh, I have uh, students who ask me, well I'm a biologist, I, I have a biology background, or I'm a physicist. Mm -hmm. um, can, I, can I get into your field? And the answer is yes. Absolutely. Uh, because yeah. the and from my experience, when I was a graduate student, I had my background, but my classmates, one was a biology, mm -hmm. uh, had a biology background, another had a psychology background. Mm -hmm. And what we're able to do is work together, work within our educational experience to sort of learn the things that we don't know, and uh, sometimes even completely switch careers. Mm -hmm. So the biologist mm -hmm. might become mm -hmm. a computationalist mm -hmm. completely. Mm -hmm. And in my case, they sort of melted together very well computer science and programming and understanding how algorithms work and mm -hmm, how to mm -hmm. put a device together and string things together to solve this complex problem clearly made a bigger impact in my, in my life. Um, I was able to uh, think of what my device was going to be, think of what my problem was, determine the solution and immediately implement it right. and determine right. if it worked. Right. And one of my uh, challenges and one of the things that I like to do for all the students that are in the lab who come from this diverse background, there's bioengineers, yeah. there's neuroscientists, there are undergraduate neuroscientists, there are speech students, speech pathology right, right. students, is getting across this idea of you can program what needs to be programmed. Right. No one has to, you don't have to be a computer science expert mm -hmm. in order to understand how to put together the different elements of a brain machine interface. Some people will do the heavy lifting uh, that is not necessary for everyone to understand, mm -hmm. but everyone has the ability to to develop this device in some way. That's very good because they, mo a lot of people think, no, that nerdy right. stuff is not for me. Right. And by the same token, the people that like the engineering side say, well, that philosophy stuff is right. irrelevant to me. But in fact, all of this is coming toward a like a new renaissance, isn't it? You Absolutely. have to kind of be a renaissance person Absolutely. to get into this field. But <laughs> right. uh, it would be very appealing, I think, to a lot of people if they could get over these hurdles. Sure. That something is just too intimidating. Right. To do. And 
To yeah. that point, uh, I can think of two things. One is uh, academic institutions are pushing, pushing, pushing interdisciplinary yeah. education now. And I feel like we've been ahead of the curve yes, uh, right. because right. we've needed it. Um, and now we can be leaders mm -hmm. for that interdisciplinary push. Uh, and then the second side of this was uh, for the type of work that we do in this lab, this speech and communication aspect, learning speech and communication, uh, someone from an engineering field might mm -hmm. think, oh, that doesn't really fit with the type of work that I've traditionally done but it made such a huge impact on what we were able to accomplish. Uh, we were able to uh, make relationships between what we think is going on in speech, what we know is going on in speech, what the neuroscience said, mm -hmm, and how, mm -hmm, what techniques mm -hmm, do we have available to switch between them. Without all three of those components, that doesn't happen. Exactly. And uh, yeah. so, so having that interdisciplinary thing, fr uh, education from the very technical to the very uh, clinical almost, and very behavioral, uh, is what helped make that happen. Right. I'd like to know how this affects uh, the training of people in speech pathology mm -hmm. today. Yeah. So uh, speech language pathology has had a long mission of providing uh, some form of communication medium to the types of patients and users and, and, and individuals that we've been talking about. Uh, this, the, the global name for this field is uh, augmentative and alternative communication. Uh, these things range from the most simple of devices where uh, you have a family member or a caretaker holding up a, a, a board and it has letters on it or it has words on it. And if you have some form of communication, so an eye blink, person, let's say, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. you're able to you know, squeeze your fist or something like that, and someone is able to observe that, uh, you can say, is, is this letter mm -hmm. correct? Is mm -hmm. this letter correct? Is this letter correct? Mm -hmm. And when you get to the right one, the, the individual indicates that that's mm -hmm. the correct mm -hmm. one. Uh, to very computational devices that are our own computers, laptops uh, that are uh, programmed with really uh, 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 interesting programs that allow users to uh, point to items with their eyes if they have yeah. eye, eye control or point to it with their head if they can move their head in certain ways. Um, that still involves some amount of um, manual user input on the part of the individual with the motor impairment. Uh, the work that we do here takes it to the next level uh, where we eliminate that motor input, that manual input, not by choice, but because uh, individuals who are using these devices no longer have that ability. And this is an, an obvious way of integrating the type of work that we do in this lab with work that's been done for mm -hmm. decades. Mm -hmm. um, and we can really use the expertise of that environment, of that field for how do we uh, interact with patients who might be using this device? How do we even mm -hmm. deploy our devices and uh, a key thing that is often forgotten, especially on the engineering side of things, is, well, what's the best device for a particular mm -hmm. person? Um, and how do we uh, measure whether or not our efforts are and our devices are actually working the way we intend them to, uh, to help communication? And speech language pathologists uh, who specialize in uh, alternative and augmentative communication uh, are trained to uh, assess both the individual prior to uh, uh, giving them some sort of communication device, but also assess the usage of that device and to determine uh, if it is actually working as intended to improve communication and quality. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna we're gonna see uh, the device in action, okay. um, and it's a it's a mobile application. So this is part of our our unlock project. Okay. Uh, we're hopefully going to be able to uh, be able to deploy this to users uh, who need a communication option. Uh, and the key thing here is that it is mobile and it is yeah. uh, portable so that it can move with them so that they're not uh, stuck in one place at one point in time. Hey, okay, this is Sean Lorenz and he's a doctoral student and he is going to demonstrate this brain and computer interface which looks very, very portable. Sean, tell us about your background please and then we'll demonstrate. Sure. Um, I actually uh, have a background in philosophy uh, and just to show that there are a lot of different backgrounds in our department but then I eventually came into more of the neurobiology um, and took a few courses on computational neuroscience loved it mm -hmm. and um, applied for this program that I'm in now and have slowly learned how to pick up those other portions of fields that I didn't know anything about such as uh, computer science 
mm -hmm. um, and have um, kind of stumbled into the brain computer interface work. It was something I've been interested in since for about five or ten years. Um, so it was, it was a pleasure to get to finally work on something uh, like this project. Um, my particular project in gen uh, is uh, more of an applied approach to brain-computer <laughs> interface. My whole project is meant to take it outside of the lab and have something that someone with locked-in syndrome could actually, or ALS, could use in their home. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm working with um, something called the steady state visually evoked potential, which is a common form of brain computer interface where uh, John mentioned it flashes mm -hmm. uh, different kinds of stimuli on a screen. We can pick that up in the visual areas of your brain, decode it, do some things on it, and help people to select something on the screen mm -hmm. for communication purposes. So primarily what I'm doing is taking phrases um, based on common phrases used by people with locked in from uh, or also from augmentative and alternative communication devices um, so that they would have a, a way to communicate with the outside world in an easy way again. Mm -hmm. um, so they would just be able to put on an EEG cap um, and then be able to have some sort of function. Um, the first round that we have it is just a grid as you'll see of different speech phrases, which mm -hmm, we'll output mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. a speech synthesizer. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm working on next is taking this BCI and making it adaptive. So how can you uh, make this more, not just about, okay, yes, I guessed correctly that you are looking up, mm -hmm. and so it moves up, but how can you, uh, based on the context of the situation right. that you're in, pick better words, better phrases for uh, the user to be able to select. Right. So let's say you're at the doctor's office and um, it would bring up, it recognizes it's 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. um, you have entered you know, by your GPS coordinates into a doctor's office. You want to select words that say things about medication or your pain levels, these sort of things. And it would automatically populate what those speech phrases are in the BCI to make it quicker for them to communicate. That's excellent, and especially the doctor's office is a great mm -hmm. idea because of when you talk about pain, there are all kinds of pain, mm -hmm. right, or itching or right. whatever. <laughs> the symptoms, the lexicon is enormous mm -hmm. for this, and so you're saying that if the patient can generate it mentally, they yes. can. this is designed ultimately to uh, sort of uh, represent it. Mm -hmm. in, and in help them to communicate way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that, can you demonstrate it for us? <laughs> I'd be now? happy to. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm right. going to get this on you right now. Why, that's even stylish. Sure. <laughs> it's very stylish. <laughs> one thing I didn't mention was the portability. Uh, yeah. Um, one nice thing about a cap like this is it completely transmits, it transmits all of the signal information from the cap wirelessly using Bluetooth that can be picked up in any uh, uh, computer, laptop, or even tablet. Um, so in the future, the, something like this could be used in like an Android tablet or whatever sort exactly. of um, um, commercially available tablet that could be made into some sort of software. And this is very light. Is it pretty sturdy also, that, or do you have to be extremely careful with the electrodes and things it's it's very it's pretty sturdy um, and it's it's um what's nice about the the area that we're picking up is it's very robust signal so okay. it works quite well for uh, a more real world application of brain computer interface. okay that's a big accomplishment by itself it, with with the wet cap now would the patient simply keep it on for you know, like more or less all day if they're going to be in a communication situation so they can avoid getting gelled or... or right, if they were wanting to communicate, they would yeah. have to keep the cap on. Yes. Is there any, is, is one better than another? I'm just assuming the gel is more accurate, so it has, allows for, but I don't know. Right, um, that has been the case. Okay. Uh, however, dry electrodes, they have been making leaps and bounds in progress. Okay. And they're getting to the point of being comparable. 
um, to the point where you could just put a, a few dry electrodes in something like a baseball cap and it'd be much more comfortable and not look like this mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, better for the user to right. wear for prolonged um, duration. Now you're attached here. I'm all attached. To... There you go. Thank you. Can you Let explain you what glasses. it is you're... Sure. So this is, uh, this is just an amp. This brings in the electrodes. Yeah. Sends it to here. Yeah. And this is what um, processes, it does some processing okay. and then transmits it to a computer where we um, try to process it and display things on the screen. Right. And you're saying that ultimately you can be able, you can do this on your cell phone or something, you know, smartphone. Right. Yeah, yeah. Smartphone you know, would be quite amazing. Whatever, uh, yes. sort of tablet or exactly. laptop you It have. really means mm -hmm. you're much more independent. Mm -hmm. So Sean's looking at uh, four flashing checkerboards in a left, right, up, and down location. And each one is flashing at a slightly different frequency. And in his mind's eye, he concentrates on one of them to either move left, right, up, or down. And by sampling for four seconds his brain signals, we're able to determine which of those choices he made with a, about a 90% accuracy. And this allows him to m m maneuver around this grid and choose uh, words that he might want to say. So, for example, Sean, can you say, I'm thirsty? I'm thirsty. Uh, and now say hello. You'll see every four seconds uh, the location moves as a decision is made. He's moving toward the hello box now. Hello. And so he's able to uh, choose words in this manner. Uh, in this case, we have a grid of fixed words, so there's only, uh, in this case, 25 words to choose from. However, we're working on hierarchical systems and also the, the intelligent systems that Sean mentioned, which will have uh, multiple uh, layers of words for different locations. So, for example, uh, words can be said in the doctor's office uh, and so forth. Uh, Sean, try one more. How about uh, saying, uh, I'm in pain? Uh, where is it? Oh, let's see. <laughs> I'm in pain. So as you can see, he, he's able to do this very accurately, and uh, this is what makes the system uh, basically ready for uh, deployment in the real world. So that's what we're working toward now with the Unlock project is getting this system, this, the very system you're looking at here, uh, out to people with locked-in syndrome and uh, donating them uh, the systems uh, to use in their homes. One nice thing about this technology is that it doesn't take a tremendous amount of training. Uh, basically, you just need to be able to concentrate on one of the different flashing stimuli. And uh, with very little training, with a few minutes, we're able to start picking up more and more accurately your intended movement from this uh, system. I'm working on uh, a project with non-invasive brain computer interfaces, uh, so with the EEG cap. I guess John mentioned it a little bit earlier that uh, what we like to do is to um, use sensory motor rhythms to control a brain computer interface. So that's the kind of brain computer interface where the user is imagining movement and um, their kind of imagined movement is being decoded in real time to control for example, a cursor on a computer screen, or in our case, we'd really like to be able to control a speech synthesizer mm -hmm. in real time. Um, so my project is one of the first questions that we want to be able to answer in developing that kind of uh, brain-computer interface, which is how, uh, how do we know when the user intends to speak and how, when they're not? So um, for example, if you have a speech synthesizer that's being controlled um, in real time, you need to be able to turn off the speech synthesizer when the user, for example, gets to the end of a sentence or um, you know, wants to pause, doesn't want to speak, you don't want the speech synthesizer to keep going. So my project is um, looking for, um, in the signal, what changes when the user um, is performing the motor imagery and what changes when they stop trying to perform motor imagery. Um, and so it's very much a... Um, computer science problem. I studied computer science and neuroscience in undergraduate. Um, and it's also um, engineering, uh, math. Uh, so I've had to learn a bunch of different fields since you know, coming to graduate school.
field. That doesn't quite sound like a curriculum, but that, did you have to kind of do it by the seat of the pants? You had to absolutely self-teaching. Is absolutely. that the new trend? For yes, <laughs> I've been learning it as it comes up. You know, yeah. it's right. so you know we're doing a lot of pa pattern recognition, yeah. um, kind of machine learning types of problems right. that I wasn't an expert in coming into it. So I've uh, been doing a lot of classes that are related to um, the research that I need to do. But it's also um, just kind of learning as I go along, uh, talking to people who know about it, and uh, kind of doing the research independently. Well, one thing that's nice <laughs> is that um, you know our department, the Graduate Program for Neuroscience, understands that it's an in interdisciplinary field. So there's a lot of flexibility in the curriculum um, for people to take classes that are um, relevant to what they're doing. I think, um, for me, it helped to have um, kind of a broad undergraduate um, education so I had done you know on the neuroscience side I'd done like I had a good foundation in neuroscience so it wasn't really hard to pick it up but I also had done programming in undergrad I'd done computer science theory and uh, you know certain math classes um, so I think you know it's good to try to think about it right from the start as being interdisciplinary but it's not obviously not necessary because uh, most people who come into the program uh, have just one you know, concentration and it's it's more than a full time job. Exactly. Um, but you know, it's the kind of thing I'm here because I love it. Yeah. So I, you know, love spending time on it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, you have to be really, really interested Flexible. in it. You know, I feel like people people who succeed are people they're here because they can't imagine doing anything exactly. else. You know, it's just what they Nothing love. Like. So I am a uh, a second year PhD student in the cognitive and neural systems program. And my project is a Celeste-funded project, and it uh, brings together two labs, uh, this lab, the Neuroprosthetics Lab, uh, for the BCI side, and the neuro, uh, Neuromorphic Engineering Lab, which looks at mobile adaptive robotics. So my particular project is looking at how we can leverage the, the BCI technology that we're working on here uh, to enable uh, locked-in patients the ability to um, control robot, robotic devices, mm -hmm. mobile devices, uh, to, to do things for them outside of their, their grasp, uh, their reach. And, and the idea is that these robots would actually be autonomous. So uh, we have a Roomba that would drive around and you, uh, as the, the, uh, in the BCI, can control the Roomba uh, through a, a video interface. So you can see what the robot sees, you can drive it around, the robot will also move around uh, on its own and then uh, you can have it go to a, a target object and say, oh, I, I want you to go uh, pick up this, this uh, coffee cup or I want you to go turn on a light. Uh, and so you're able to, to do that. Uh, so that's, that's the work I'm uh, currently doing. So uh, the, the Neuromorphics Lab, their focus on robotics is in fact in this idea of robotics driven through neural models. Yeah. So we're, our actual interest is how do we use um, what we understand about the brain, models of the brain, can we implement them in, a, in a, a autonomous agents? Uh, because standard robotics, you can do sort of a, what I like to call an engineered solution. It's just a bunch of differential equations. It, it handles very specific things. It's designed to do a very specific task. But humans are very generalizable, and that's something that we're really fascinated by. And that's what we look for in robotics is uh, you know, object identification. We have a robot moving around. How can it tell uh, that it's looking at a discrete object from a background, from a single image? It's a very hard problem, both in computer vision uh, in general, but also in uh, neural models. And we feel that if we can understand how the brain can do things like, how do we know how to reach out for something? This is such an intuitive concept to us, but to have a robot do this um, from, a, from a neural basis and, and to be able to understand the difference between uh, reaching like this, or reaching like this, uh, or, or reaching to a, an object, grasping an object, having an understanding that that is an object in the space, that is, um, is very hard to do uh, from, from a standard sort of computer uh, systems approach. So uh, we feel that using neural models, the way we think that we do this, um, will give us uh, an advantage uh, in the long run to allow robots to be much more interactive in the environment, uh, as well as, as with the human-robotic interaction. Right. My, uh, my, my interest is actually primarily in the brain-machine interface. That's, that's how I got into this. Mm -hmm. um, my, uh, my background is in uh, biomedical engineering mm -hmm. and bioinformatics, uh, and both of those were focused on neural uh, engineering aspects. Uh, how do we, um, specifically on uh, implantable electrodes, and then also in large-scale neural simulation, can we, how, how can we use 
the neural signal to uh, you know, basically go beyond our, ourselves. Can we uh, interact uh, for both rehabilitative and augmentative purposes? Um, and this is something that I've been doing for a long time. Uh, I actually uh, worked in the industry for a while uh, before I came to this program. So uh, it was a case where you can't, you can't do this when you're you know, in a nine to five job, uh, sitting behind a computer all day. You just don't have the resources or the, the time. So I came back to, to grad school uh, to work on this um, because it's just something I'm really, really fascinated and passionate about doing. Um, uh, I've spent many, many uh, a sleepless night working on <laughs> getting, yes. getting these things to work. But having the ability uh, to work on things where uh, I feel like I'm really working toward building something really useful, something that people could really uh, benefit from. And, and that's something that just drives me to, to do this. And so, you know, 24 hours at a time, that's, that's, that's fine, you know. Very few. Uh, computer programming is critical, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, having a, have a good understanding of, of software development um, is, is very, very important for a lot of, of what we do because uh, as, as seen, you know, these applications, they don't write themselves and right. they have a lot of, uh, of moving parts and they have a lot of, of elements to make them look good and to be polished and to be functional. So having a strong computer background is, is very important. For brain-machine interface, signal processing. Mm. Absolutely need to understand signal processing, where these signals come from, how to deal with them, what it means to work with, with time series data uh, is, is also critical. So. Um, and obviously, you know, it would help to understand the brain a little bit. <laughs> so you know where these signals, why, you know, what is generating these signals, why, uh, as you're analyzing them. They're not just, you know, things that are uh, created in a vacuum. They come from somewhere. And understanding that EEG is highly, highly correlated. You need to know that these signals uh, are, are highly related and you accommodate for that so you can isolate those signals of interest.